There are a lot of things that I could tell you about Jaslyn. Uh, I wouldn't have enough time. I never have enough time to tell you everything about her. Uh, but today I hope to tell you parts of her story that I haven't told to anybody else. That kinda, kinda helps us understand, one, suicide is complex, and that it's affected by both our nature and our nurture. And it was in her nature, it was in her predispositioned genetics because of what happened to my mother. But I think over time, and leading up until that moment, everything else that contributed to her suicide was a result of the nurture that she did or did not receive. Rumor has it my mother named me Brandy because she liked the drink, but my mother also died by suicide. Um, so with Jaslyn, their suicides were about 39 years apart. That makes two out of three generations to die by suicide. Um, but knowing now that both my mother and my daughter died by suicide puts me in the middle of that bullseye. And it's part of what is pushing me to speak out and to kind of help break the stigma that surrounds it. Jaslyn was born October 7th, 1999 at 5.55 p.m. And she was a miracle before she was even born because they had told me previously they thought I had a tubal pregnancy and she may be medically aborted. And she came into this world welcomed and loved by her grandparents, uh, myself and her father. She was my oldest child and my only daughter, but she herself has four parents. She has myself and her biological father and also her bonus parents. We don't like to use the word step, uh, but her bonus parents chose to be part of her life. She also has three brothers and three other sisters, uh, most of which are younger than her, and her her and her youngest sister had a good relationship. She got to watch her little baby sister grow up, and that was one thing she'd always wanted was a baby sister. She was old enough to remember her as a baby, whereas her two younger brothers, the closest in age being 15 months apart, they were almost like twins when they were growing up. And then my youngest son and child, just a few years younger than Jaslyn, so they were able to grow up together until their younger sister was born and their older brother, their bonus brother, uh, through my second marriage, actually ended up being a pretty big group. And she's got a couple other sisters uh, from different mothers, but the core central group was a loving and caring family. We were a divided family being a divorced household. And that didn't happen, you know, until after she was 10, between the ages of 10 and 13. She was very smart. She actually graduated high school a year early because she dedicated her summers to summer school to earn those credits. Suicide is complex. It's not a one-time thing. It's not something that just spawns out of nowhere. It takes a series of events over time to come to one cataclysmic moment in when that person is only focused on ending whatever pain or suffering they're going through and they feel that that's the only decision that they have left. There are other things in their lives that would have led up to that and the same was true probably with my mom but definitely because I knew my daughter and I watched her grow and I, I saw her life as it happened. I'm able to kind of pinpoint more of those times uh, to help myself understand and to help myself get through the grief, but also maybe to help other people identify that things were out of our control because survivors carry a lot of guilt, wondering what they could have done different or how they could have done things differently. 
but in those moments, if we haven't gotten the warning signs or we're not present right there with them, it is not something that can be changed. So we have to be able to let ourselves grieve and let go of some of that guilt by understanding what happened during their life. So we were always very proud of her. We always expressed how much we loved her. I always wanted her to understand that she was never judged uh, because as she grew older, she began to seek acceptance in the world and through her friends, like the uh, middle school age, she was introduced to the emo culture and to the LGBTQ culture, which at first didn't really bother me because I myself had a history in the LGB community before it became the TQ community. And both of her godparents were in the LGB community, uh, one of which has passed now from overdose a long time ago uh, before life-saving methods were really made available, but her godfather is still living and was part of her funeral ceremony. But when Jaslyn was in school and looking for new friends and seeking acceptance in these groups, I had a conversation with her and I explained to her that all you never need to do is to be who you're going to be, be yourself. As she continued to grow and, and when she reached the age where she was able to take off on her own, she, she did just that. And she bounced around for a while before she became stable. And I always followed along with her and told her, send me your selfies, let me know you're okay, touch base with me, communicate, and come home if you need to. Uh, but she told me one time, she goes, Mom, I love you, but I can't live with you. And I said, I understand. You have to be who you want to be. You have to be able to spread your wings. You have to learn from your own mistakes. You know, I told her I can always guide you, and it's up to you on what you do with that guidance. But just know that you're never judged. She wanted to transition for a while. She started going by Silas closer to the time of her death. But throughout her life, she had made up all kinds of nicknames, everything from Ashton Blaze to Jay Gatsby and um, Xanthus Phantom, J. Lux Michaelius. I mean, she had so many that, that I, I have a hard time listing and remembering all of them. So I didn't think much of it. And I told her where her name came from. It was part of her dad's name, part of my middle name, that it was special, that her middle name came from her grandmother on her father's side. And, and we talked about you know, even if it were me renaming her, what options I would look into, and I gave her ideas, but I didn't push her on the subject. And every once in a while, we'd see a message pop up on Facebook saying, hey, you got to call me by this name, or I'm going to disown you, and this and that. But we also saw those posts being deleted. And I know that Jaslyn cared and cared about and loved her family. Um, there's one video specifically where she expresses how sad her mom would be if she had killed herself. And I remembered commenting and telling her, yeah, how devastated I would be. And very quickly that post got taken off of Facebook. After her death, her partner and roommate at the time provided me a file of her photos and, and that video was in there. And I, I recognized it and I remembered it. But while she was getting stable and exploring the community, she did meet a young man who, when he was introduced to me, was introduced as her boyfriend. And him and her stayed in a, in a room I was renting for somebody else that was like a house, but an apartment complex. So I was able to give them shelter and I was able to let them know you're safe, I accept you, you know, let's help you guys get stable and get on your feet. And when I met this young man, I thought he's nice, he's polite, he's respectful, he's clean, he made a good impression on me. I had trouble understanding at first why her father may not have been happy with this young man, but what dad likes his daughter's boyfriend, you know? But as time grew and time went on, Jaslyn and her boyfriend, as she originally called him, began to switch pronouns. They had been stable in their own apartment and were living on their own and Jaslyn was working hard 
and I started hearing little things. Um, switching the pronouns, that didn't bother me. I understood that these kids were exploring whatever community they were a part of, but that they were doing it together. And as their relationship grew and her boyfriend began to further transition and address himself then as her girlfriend, uh, they had, like I said, they had switched the pronouns. They were going by aliases. I eventually found out the name that I met the young man under was not his original name. Uh, but it was a very neutral name, so I hadn't thought much of it. And I still had good, good things to say about this young man because of our relationship and our interactions with each other. But long before that, I kind of want to back up a little bit because Jaslyn had experienced in middle school an issue with cutting and she had been hospitalized in a behavioral health unit for children her age. For a long time, the rumors and the cutting stopped. And when she had met her boyfriend and then became stable afterwards, I felt, I felt relieved. I felt like what happened to my mom may be a less chance with my daughter. And so when Jaslyn reached the age of 21, 22, and finally into 23, I said, well, she's past the age when my mom died by suicide at 21. So I was just happy to know that she was still able to continue growing and continue living. And, and I had relaxed quite a bit. We didn't receive a lot of these big red flag warning signs that we would have gotten if she were living in the household with us. And I had trusted that if something were wrong, that the then girlfriend would have reached out to me because she felt comfortable and trusted me. But again, these, these warning signs weren't told to us. Kansas City 911, call ticket 76. Hi, my boyfriend um, tried to hang himself. He's in the closet right now. There's still noises and breathing, but I need an ambulance here immediately. So when stepmom first received the call in the middle of the night, her second call, of course, was to me and then to try to wake up the ex-husband, let him know what was going on, uh, Jaslyn's father. It was like our worst nightmare. Okay, it finally came true. 
And all the times I used to say, I'm always afraid when you call me because something might be bad. Being in divided households, if you're co-parenting and you don't always talk to each other unless it's about the kids, and you're not expecting something happy to be happening, um, like a wedding, a birth of a grandchild, when you get a call in the middle of the night from that other parent, your heart hits the floor. But we said, now the worst has happened. We've gotten those phone calls. And everything started kind of going by in a whirlwind because Jaslyn was resuscitated after her suicide attempt and she was in the ICU. Uh, she wasn't in the emergency room when our two households arrived at the hospital separately. And what was most surprising was that they didn't have her under her name. So the issue of going by the alias, which we had told her we always need to make sure that officials coming to help you need to know who you are. She arrived at the hospital as a Jane Doe. They had given her another alias with the last name of Taiwan. So it's even more shocking as, as we're being told by the hospital that, hey, your child isn't here and not sure what's going on. Um, you know, they, they had her on a ventilator and they had given us a diagnosis. Um, it's hard to remember the exact words, but I remember them saying diffused axon, which I study a little bit in neurology because of psychology. And so I knew that the part of her brain that sends electric signals back and forth to control the body's subliminal uh, functions was, was damaged. And it was damaged because of lack of oxygen. We were told the following day the brain swelling had began and we were facing the decision of removing her from the ventilator. I remembered that Jaslyn posted about being a pre-registered organ donor. Uh, and I knew what a hero walk or an honor walk was. So we had all started talking about this and we met with Midwest Transplant Network who uh, coordinated everything. And of course we set a date for an honor walk and to have her removed from the ventilator. So Jaslyn became an organ donor on March 25th of 2023 at 5.34 p.m. Both of her kidneys and her liver went to save the lives of three other people. At the rising of the sun and it's going down. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter. This morning I talked to one of Jaslyn's kidney recipients who is a mother of two. And I was overjoyed to talk to her, to know her, to know she's still with her babies and that she's able to finish watching them grow and being a mom to them. The other kidney recipient is a 62-year-old gentleman who had reached out to me uh, around Halloween of last year and I'm still waiting to hear back from the one liver recipient. Uh, I believe he was closer to 73, but can you imagine being given a second chance of life at 73 years old? Or, or being, being those two little girls who thought, we might lose our mom. I mean, I'm a little girl who lost her mom, but I, I didn't know I'd lost her because I'd already been adopted and, and didn't find out till later in my life. But there's still a part of me that's like, wow. My mom died by suicide. I can't go knock on her door. I can't go say, hi, it's me. I love you. I'm here. Look at me. Look at my kids, you know? And so the organ donation is a huge helping factor for us. Pretty much had already begun grieving in the hospital as we knew what was going to happen. But since then, I've, I've looked back and I've thought over the environment she was living in close to her time of death. I know that because my mother died by suicide, that my daughter had a predispositioned genetic nature for suicide. I know that because she had a divorced family and struggled for acceptance and friendship from her peers, that there were you know, a few extenuating external circumstances in her nurture that might have eventually contributed to her hierarchy of needs being affected. Um, 
when it comes to acceptance in a group and acceptance in a family unit, it can really damage or improve our self-esteem and it can help us or decline us from reaching self-transcendence. So those parts of her pyramid were a little damaged and in her direct home life, her direct nurture, she had begun to have problems with the boyfriend-girlfriend situation as her partner began to change and transition. Jaslyn considered it, but she did not transition. She was helping her roommate, her partner, with the transitioning phase, but she was the only source of income. So they actually brought in another roommate, um, a potential partner, to lighten the load income-wise. That way she would have her shelter and stability, that, that very beginning part of Maslow's hierarchy that she needed to feel secure and to feel stable. But as time went on, her two partners and roommates were biologically male and transitioning to female. They were growing closer and we believe that maybe there was a little separation there. Jaslyn being the only biological female was now in a dangerous triangle that psychologically is difficult for even a mentally stable person to undergo. You know, throughout her life she had taken medications. We had discussed medications. I warned her about, you know, not taking the right thing or how to take the proper thing and her last medication she had posted it was making her feel funny about a month before she died and she had stopped taking it. Um, so at the time of her death she was unmedicated which may have increased these feelings that she was having of insecurities. But as the two roommates grew closer and Jaslyn grew farther from them, we assume, of course, that this created problems. They, the, they did tell me that, yes, they were fighting. They were arguing the night of her death. They had been fighting over the relationship for the past few months. Um, both of the other partners did express to me that they had grown close to each other. And we see that, that maybe in the nurture, in her environment, it was changing drastically from her having the one person she loved, that she was building a life with, to now she had almost lost that person. And it, it was causing her to be depressed. Her uh, partner eventually explained to us that before her death she was talking about committing suicide. And, you know, I can't blame that person for, you know, not running to tell something because not everybody knows what to do when they're faced with that. Um, her partner also had some previous mental health issues, uh, family problems and things like that. So part of the division between the roommate partner as well was that it was causing division between her and her family. So when we think that maybe she felt like, well, maybe her family didn't support her and she was losing her partner in the relationship, it's, it's a cataclysm in that series of events that led to push her over that edge. But we were told by the partner that that night in that argument, they had said the worst things you could possibly say to another person. We can only imagine um, that that may have included telling her to kill herself or possibly mentioning a method of how she would kill herself. I personally don't mention the method because I don't want to glorify those things. I don't want to glorify the wrong portions of her suicide method because I don't want somebody else to see that and think, hey, it worked for her, it'll work for me. That's pretty much recommended by the AFSP because I've researched their guidelines and, and understood how to create a safe space for speaking. But it's not an option. It didn't work for her. It's not working for us. It's not the way out. Suicide leaves a trail of devastation behind it. It may relieve pain and suffering for the person attempting or going through with the action, but it leaves a family and it leaves friends and it, and it leaves people behind that want to seek answers, that may have trouble finding those answers. 
Jaslyn herself didn't leave a note of any kind, or if it if there was, it was removed by the partner. Um, but it's not a way out, so that's why I refrain really from from mentioning a lot of the method. Uh, but the nature and the nurture is very important to me because suicide is so complex, and. When searching to understand what my daughter was going through, it helps to be able to put together some of the pieces by understanding, you know, where she was at in her frame of mind. And in this case, I honestly believe that it was done out of revenge uh, because of the arguments that they were going through and that it is common with suicide. There are other reasons sometimes that people consider suicide, but in this case, I definitely think it was to kind of try to get back at the living situation and the nurture that she was receiving. But the manner in which the act was conducted was a manner in which she could have saved herself. She could have stopped it. She could have stood up on her own and relieved her restraints. Um, so we believe that she assumed that help would come sooner. But we also know that she had been drinking that night. She was on the low side of intoxication, but it's just enough to alter the way that we think, and, and it's enough to alter our judgment in, in assuming that if her roommate told her to do that and she said, okay, I'm gonna do it out of revenge, He'll, this person will come in and find me soon enough, help will be here, no problem. Uh, but help didn't make it quite in time. Um, by the time they did, her roommates found Jaslyn in her condition and were able to call 911 enough minutes had already gone by that the lack of air had begun to make brain damage. In the field, it took multiple attempts for resuscitation, and I think they eventually, I forget the name of what it's called, uh, when they give you the shot that gets your heart going again, um, I think they had to do that twice, and that actually restricts more blood flow for recovery afterwards, so it additionally may have contributed to the irreversibility of the anoxic brain damage that, that was done. Jaslyn made her attempt on March 22nd after midnight. She had arrived at the hospital around 1.15 that morning, and we lived through the next three days at the hospital by her side. We were able to give her final and proper respects and goodbyes through her honor walk and of course through her funeral. And now I hope that by being able to tell her story that somebody else out there will, will hear it and know that number one, they are not alone, whether they are a lost survivor or they are an attempt survivor. That number two, they matter because Jaslyn mattered to us greatly. And there's not a day that goes by that she doesn't feel every second and every moment of my thoughts. But she had a big heart and she cared for many, many causes. So as a mother, I'm picking up her cause. And I'm hoping that through her story, somebody else will decide to stay. Somebody else will decide and see a mom that's out there hurting and say, I can't do this to my family, to my friends. I hope that they would say something to somebody to speak out, to reach out to somebody and to get help. You know, just to send up a signal so somebody knows that, hey, something's wrong and I need some help with this. So I really appreciate the opportunity for getting to tell you these things and getting to share these things with you. And, and like I said in the beginning, there's never enough time to tell you everything to know about Jaslyn. But if I could tell you probably the most important thing today is that she was saved. She believed in Jesus. She may not have practiced 
but at the young age of 12, she had received him into her heart. And through her donation of her organs and her gift of life to others, I know first and foremost, God fulfills his promise of salvation. But I know that he used her to bring hope to others, and for that she'll be rewarded in heaven. And I know she'll be there waiting on me, probably right up at the gate. <laughs> and so I'm thankful for that. And I am thankful that God has given me the peace and the comfort and the strength to be bold enough to be able to share these things today. And I pray that anybody out there who sees or watches this, that they would know that there is a hope greater than what this world has to offer and that Jesus loves them. He loved my daughter. He loves me, and he keeps his promises to us. So even in the face of the hardest, most difficult decision of her life and ours, we're able to find some kind of hope that we can share with other people through her story. The AFSP actually has a program running right now called Talk Away the Dark, and I believe that Papa Roach is in support of that as they've also produced their new song, Leave a Light On. Um, it's kind of a follow-up from 20-some years ago to their song, um, Last Resort, which Last Resort is a very nitty-gritty song about suicide. Uh, but Leave a Light On is in support of AFSP's Talk Away the Dark, so I think the number one and most important thing that I could share about suicide is that we can prevent suicide by being open and talking about our mental health with each other more often. When talking to somebody in crisis, you ask them, are you hungry? Are you alone? Are you lonely? Are you tired? Uh, because a lot of times our emotions are affected by our physical being if we're not well-rested and, and well-fed or well-hydrated, our physical body can start to play tricks on our mind, too, because our mind is fed by what we nourish our body so that it can function properly. But that little method kind of helps people go, well, yeah, I'm angry today, or hey, I'm lonely today, or I'm tired today. And you kind of can work backwards from whatever the problem was to finding a solution for it, or at least feeling better to be able to talk about it. Most times, just being able to vent and get something off your chest to another person who understands is all that somebody else really needs. An ear to listen, a shoulder to cry on, somebody to give them a hug. You know, hugs give that physical, you know, release of endorphins that a lot of people need. So it's important to be able to to ask somebody, how are you doing today? And to encourage them to give that honest answer that oh, I'm good, we're not always good. Sometimes we're awful and we're trying to fake like we're good, but we're not. 